Hi there, everyone. I'm Jenna Roll, Director of Education at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and Sea Center. Tonight, I am excited to introduce a local budding bee expert and Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and Sea Center Teen Programs Manager, Charlie Thrift. Charlie has studied bees at UCSB in the Cheadle Center for Biodiversity and Ecological Restoration for the past three years. Charlie is an alum of the museum, first in the Quasars to Sea Stars Teen Science Program that he now manages, how cool, uh, then as a Nature Adventures Camp Instructor and as the Teen Program's first intern. One fun fact about Charlie is that he's also a musician. I once heard him play Ricky Martin's Live in La Vida Loca around a campfire, but he says his favorite time playing keyboard in the band was in the band for UCSB's production of the musical Mamma Mia is one of his proudest accomplishments, second only to teaching the next generation of scientists, of course. Uh, thank you so much for being with us this evening, Charlie. Please feel free to take it away. All right, awesome. Well, thank you for that great introduction. Um, I'm going to pull up some slides, but before I do, I just wanted to ask um, who here in our lovely 80 person Zoom webinar has been stung by a bee before? And if you want to go ahead and type in the chat, um, oh, or you can raise your hand too, that's fun. Um, if you want to send in the chat, um, you can set it to send to everyone so we can all see it. Um, say, like, yes, I've been stung by a bee two times or zero times eight, 10, depending on how lucky you've been. See, I'm seeing a lot of raised hands. At least 20 for one person. As a beekeeper, I get stung once in a while. Okay, very true, very true. All right, cool. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, my follow-up question to that, which you do not need to answer in the chat, um, but just to think about would be, um, what type of bee was it that stung you? Um, was this a honeybee or was this some other type of bee? Um, now we know that there are multiple different types of bees in the world, um, and that's pretty much what this whole talk is about. So we're gonna learn all about them, but um, just sort of a fun, fun intro there. Okay, I'm still seeing a lot of chats come in, very fun. Thank you everyone for participating. I'm gonna pull up some slides. Okay, so I am going to um, paint you a quick little picture. It's the 1990s. Um, there is a woman who is deathly afraid of bees. Um, she has this innate fear. Um, she knows it's not super rational, um, but she can't really help it. It's just natural. Um, and she decides with her husband that before they have kids, they want to sort of you know, get over that fear a little bit so that they don't teach their kids to be afraid of something irrational. Um, they don't want to teach that fear necessarily. Um, and now that woman was, of course, my mom, and she, I think, overcorrected. So I think bees are the coolest things in the world, um, and it's my mission tonight to convince you all of the same. All right. So before I begin, I just want to do um, some quick thank yous to the people who have helped me um, along the way and are really integral to me being here with you tonight. Um, Katya Seltman, Michelle Lee and Claudia Tyler, my mentors at UCSB, who have worked with me on all of my bee research. Um, Jenna Roll, of course, mentor in general, um, and the entire museum, which has been um, a part of my journey through science and through, and through researching bees, um, as I will tell you all about. So I'm gonna walk you through um, my path with getting involved in bee research. Um, and along the way, we'll talk about um, a few different types of bees and a few different things um, that I've learned and gotten to work through. Um, but it all started for me in the Quasars to Sea Stars program at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Um, this teen work science, um, work study volunteer program is super cool. Um, and here I got to um, learn all about museums and natural history. Um, and also do my own um, research project. During my senior year of the Quasars program, I got to start my um, coveted senior research project. Um, and for, for me, I decided that I wanted to look at bees and I wanted to do something with bees. Um, and so for this project, I ended up collecting bees um, around the museum campus um, and then looking at their pollen. So this is a picture of 
that occurring. Um, you can see that lovely poison oak in the foreground. Um, luckily, that did not um, end up being a problem for me that day. Um, so when I'm talking about these bees that I was looking at, um, of course, I'm talking about honeybees at this point. And so this is one of the bees that I collected um, during that project and then photographed. And so this is a honeybee. Um, and this is probably the type of bee that most people think of um, that comes to mind when most people think about bees. And so we see, you know, this, this bee has, um, you know, our typical bee shape is carrying its pollen on its leg, all of that good stuff. Um, something really interesting about honeybees, though, is that they are non-native species. So this is one of our only non-native bee species in this area. Um, it was introduced from Europe. Um, and it was introduced on purpose to the Americas so that people could keep it for beekeeping um, and use it for pollinating agricultural crops. Now, of course, native bees, other bee species, were already pollinating crops and already pollinating flowers and everything here. Um, so just keep that in mind. But something I really like about this picture is you can see the eyes on this bee, or the eye, um, and we notice that the eye is actually hairy. There's these hair structures coming out of the center of that eye. And this is the only bee species in Santa Barbara that has hairy eyes. So it's sort of this interesting thing that we can look at under a microscope and see and know it's definitely an Apis mellifera. Here's the same honeybee, um, just from the top down view. And I like this picture because we can see um, where the honeybee carries its pollen on its hind leg in the back there. It's packed into this nice, um, dense little pollen basket. Um, but not all bees carry their pollen like this. A lot of them carry it in different ways, and we'll see um, all of those different strategies. All right, so those were female worker bees. Um, but this is actually, these two pictures are actually of male drone honeybees. Um, and so, you know, a honeybee um, can be a queen female bee, or a male drone, or a female worker. And these male drones, we don't often see them outside of their hive um, because they generally don't leave um, their hive, their colony, unless they're getting kicked out by um, a group of worker female bees. So if the going gets tough and they don't have a whole lot of excess supplies, um, the workers will decide to kick out some of the men um, because they don't really do anything to help the hive besides um, fertilize eggs for the queen, fertilize the queen. And so the males um, look a little bit different than the females. We see their eyes are much bigger, take up a larger portion of their head, and they sort of touch at the top um, in a way that sort of makes them look like flies. Um, and so this male bee I found on the ground, and so I picked it up, took some pictures, and then I made my mom hold it because, of course, it's a male bee, so it doesn't have a stinger, it cannot sting. Um, so I got some good pictures of her as well. All right, so also during high school, um, I got a little bit involved in beekeeping, and this is, of course, with the honeybee as well. Um, and beekeeping was super cool for so many reasons, um, but part of the reason why we can keep bees is because the honeybees are eusocial. And so um, what that means is that honeybees like to live in big groups together. And so they've got their one queen bee and then a few hundred male drone bees and then tens of thousands of worker bees, worker females, that do everything um, that is needed to run the hive. And so as beekeepers, we're able to, um, and I see we have some beekeepers in the chat, so that's, that's um, fun. Thank you for joining. Feel free to call me out if I get something wrong here. Um, but we're able to um, keep them in you know, set areas and um, eventually harvest their honey and stuff like that, as well as transport them as we um, decide to do often to pollinate specific agricultural areas. Um, part of the reason we think that these bees live in these big social clumps like this um, is because they are what we call haplodiploid. And that basically means that males and females have different um, chromosomal um, arrangements. So male bees have just one set of every chromosome and female bees have two sets of every chromosome. They're diploid. Um, and so what that means is that if you have a bee egg and it is fertilized, it will become a female bee. Um, and if you take a bee egg and it is not fertilized, it will become a male bee. So we'll just have half of the chromosomes. 
And if anyone is super good at both mental math and Punnett squares at 6.45 p.m., um, you'll know that this means that a female bee is more genetic re genetically related to her own sisters than she would be to her own progeny. So it is in the interests of the individual female bee to live her entire life supporting her own colony rather than um, trying to make it on her own and have her own children, which is super interesting um, and we think has allowed for this really tight eusociality to occur. Um, if you were to call a beekeeper and you're not a beekeeper already in this, in this webinar, um, you might be doing so to um, have them help you remove some bees from some area that you don't want them to be set up in. So this picture on the right is me and some, some other people removing um, a swarm of bees that had set up shop in a water meter. Um, and so, you know, we came in there and brought the bees out, put them into, you know, a box that they can live in instead of this water meter and ended up taking them, um, taking them home. So after, after um, my, my brief stints with beekeeping ended um, I, and high school ended, I went to UCSB and I quickly started um, working in the Cheadle Center for Biodiversity and Ecological Restoration, or CBER. Um, and CBER is super cool. It's a really great, um, has a really great collections and research center um, specifically focusing on bees, um, but it also has a lot of other collections and a lot of other research going, going on there. But it was through CBER that I got to um, continue my work with bees, but expand towards um, all different types of bees, not just the one honeybee species that we have here. And so um, if you look at this box in the right, these are some of the first bees that I curated at CBER. And in the top left are a bunch of honeybees, um, but everything else in this box is also a bee. So, a lot of things that people don't necessarily think of as bees might actually be bees. And a lot of things um, are, a lot of these bees are um, super diverse and super um, unique in their morphology and in their structures. All right, I'm gonna do a quick lesson on taxonomy. Um, I also want to say, if you have questions that come up um, along the way, please go ahead and send those in the um, Q and A and we can get to them at the end. There's gonna be plenty of time for questions. Um, so if you think of something and you don't wanna forget it, just send it, go ahead and send it now and then we can come back to it. So a quick taxonomy lesson um, that you probably learned in, I don't know, maybe seventh or eighth grade. Um, if we were looking at this fox here, um, of course, this is in the animal kingdom in the class with all the mammals, um, order carnivora. Um, and then it goes all the way down family, genus, and species. So if we're talking about bees, um, we're in the class Insecta with all the insects. And then in the order Hymenoptera, which includes all bees, all wasps, and all ants. And then we go down to the family level and there are seven different bee families. Okay, so of these seven families, we see that families, um, family names end in that D-A-E ending. So Apidae, Andrinidae, Caledidae, Helictidae, Negachylidae, um, and these include things like honeybees and bumblebees and apidae. And then the Andrinidae family is all solitary and they actually nest in the ground. The majority of bees um, in the world do not nest um, in hives or in colonies together. The majority of them are solitary and the majority of them nest in the ground by themselves. Then we've got the polyester or the cellophane bees, the sweat bees, leafcutter bees, and then these last two families are super small. So Melididae, um, these are specialists and they're solitary as well. And we don't see them very often in Santa Barbara. Um, so when bees are specialists, that means that rather than going to lots of different types of flowers and pollinating lots of different things, um, they prefer to only pollinate like one or two different types of things, one or two different types of, types of flowers. And then the Strinotridae family is only found in Australia. So I will not be covering it today in my Santa Barbara bee talk. Um, but across these seven families of bees, there are over 20,000 different species in the world. So bees are super diverse and there is so much more than just the honeybee that we often think about when we think of bees. So I'm gonna talk about each family a little bit and show some, some cool pictures of things that we could find in Santa Barbara. So from the Apidae family, this is the most speciose bee family. Of course, there's the honeybee, 
um, but there are also bumblebees. And so you may have seen these out in your yard. Um, the, bum the bumblebee on the bottom right is the Bombus crotchii, and this is an endangered um, bumblebee that we have found um, evidence of out at um, the North Campus open space past UCSB, which is super, super cool, super exciting. Um, and you may have seen some of these other bumblebees around your yard. Also in the APD family are the Anthophora. Um, these are the digging bees. And these have these really, um, really beautiful bright green eyes. And these are a great example of bees that love to dig and, and live in the ground. Now we also have our carpenter bees that I'm sure many people have heard of. Um, but what you may not have heard of is that there are two different types, two different genera of carpenter bees. There's the serotina, which are very small. Um, this picture, it doesn't do the best at showing the scale, but this um, serotina bee is on a dandelion flower. So these are very small bees. And then in contrast to that, we have the xylocopa, which are the large carpenter bees. And so these are some of the largest bees in the world are xylocopa. Um, one species that we have in California, or in Santa Barbara, the xylocopa sonorina, are an example of a sexually dimorphic species. And so this bee on the top in that sort of orangish brown teddy bear color is a male xylocopa sonorina. And the picture on the bottom with the, the dark um, coloration and those really pretty iridescent wings is a female um, xylocopa sonorina. So same species, but very different appearance. And then we also have our cuckoo bees or um, parasitic kleptoparasite bees. So an example of this is the nomada genera or genus. And so this bee right here, um, we see it looks a little bit more wasp-like. Um, it doesn't have a whole lot of pollen, um, pollen carrying hairs. Um, and it has that really thin um, waist where the abdomen and the thorax meet. And what this bee does is it watches all the other bees that are going about um, performing the job of collecting their own pollen and nectar and making nice little provisions for their young to have, um, to take care of their young. And it says, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna wait for that bee to leave its nest. And then I'm gonna go in there and either steal all the food that is prepared and my day will be, my, and my work will be done, or I will just put my eggs right next to all of that food so that my bees, my bee progeny, just have those resources for them. So they are freeloading bees. Um, but these are super interesting because when we find them in the environment, it's a sign that the other bees are doing really well. Because if we're able to, if our environment is able to support these parasitic bees, um, then we must be also supporting the bees that they parasitize. Um, so finding some of these kleptoparasites is usually a good indicator that we have other healthy bees in the population. All right, so the Andrinidae family. Um, this is a, a bit of a smaller family, only 3,000 species. Um, and these are all solitary, so none of them like to be social. But what's interesting here is that um, even among our solitary bees, which the majority of them are, um, they're still haplodiploid. So they still have that genetic relatedness thing where they would be more genetically, rela genetic genetically there we go, related to their sisters than they would be to their own progeny. Um, of course, that doesn't stop them from having their own progeny, but um, those are the genetics that they have. And those are the genetics that all wasps and all ants have as well, which is pretty interesting. So Andrinity, um, they like to nest in the ground. Um, they have these, this nice facial hair on them, um, and they're also really good in cold weather. And those two facts are probably not um, causation, um, but I like to remember it that way because it seems like they have that nice beard, and so that's how they do well in the cold. Um, but they are very hard workers because when it is literally too cold for them to fly in a very cold morning, they will walk to work. They will walk um, and climb up the stems of flowers, do their pollination, climb back down, go climb on a, up on another flower. Um, I don't know about all of you, but tomorrow morning, if it's still raining, I will definitely not be going on a run. So these ones, these bees beat me. Um, they're also really interesting because they, they hedge their bets. Um, so for Andrina, um, they emerge in the spring. So they overwinter, you know, as, as um, larva and pupa. And then they emerge as adult bees in the spring, but they have to know when they should emerge because they want to make sure that all of the flowers that they like are out and that the weather is suitable. And also that their fellow, you know, that their fellow bees will be out and about so that they can mate. 
Um, and so if they emerge too early, you know, maybe there won't be any, any flowers in bloom. If they emerge too late, maybe, you know, everyone's already, everyone has already mated and they won't be able to do that. Um, so they need to, need to emerge at the right time. And this is where a lot of scientific research is focused because um, scientists are worried that if there is a disconnect between flowering and um, bee and other pollinator activity, um, then we'll have big problems in terms of getting plants pollinated and supporting um, bee populations. And so what Andrina do is um, some of them will emerge early by, by design, some of them will emerge late by design, some in the middle, and um, that ensures that you know, at least some, if not most of these Andrina um, are going to be emerging at the right time with the right environmental conditions. Um, and so when other bees, like we see a lot of bombus relying on other environmental cues like temperature and stuff like that, um, that's all, that's all a great strategy unless we're in a very, a time of a very volatile changing climate. Um, and we have others, other things like other plants responding to different environmental cues. So these Andrina are interesting because they, they aren't falling, falling prey to that. Um, you might see little holes in the ground, especially on, you know, maybe ground that's maybe not super disturbed. So if you're like the first person on a hiking trail after a little while, or if you have some bare ground in your, in your yard, you see a bunch of little holes next to each other. Um, you could you could stop and watch it for a few minutes and see if see if any of these Andrina fly in and out of those holes um, because they like to nest in the ground. They like to nest near each other, um, but they don't. They're not in like one big nest, one big hive underneath because they are solitary. So they like their personal space still. All right. So the Colettidae family. Um, is a pretty small family as well, of only about 2,500 species. Um, these are all solitary and ground nesting as well. Um, and they have this interesting um, eye shape, um, call that sub parallel, but I think of it as looking a bit like an alien. So their eyes, instead of being um, parallel on their face like this in that diagram on the left, they're more tilted inwards like the diagram on the right. Um, and so I think they look a little bit like aliens, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so the Caledes or Caledes um, genus that we have in Santa Barbara, they look a little bit similar to honeybees. That's the picture on the top. But those eyes have that really interesting shape that is um, not shared by honeybees. And then in Santa Barbara, we also have the Hylaeus um, bee on the bottom. And these bees are super cute, super small. And they have this really cool face mask, this um, very bright, shiny yellow um, masking pattern on their face. Um, they also don't have any scopa or pollen collecting, pollen carrying hairs. And instead they eat their pollen and then they spit it up later. So it's, that's, their, that's their method of carrying things around. They don't, they don't mess around with trying to attach it onto their body. So my favorite um, bee family is the Helictidae. Um, these are all the sweat bees. And they're called sweat bees because they are often attracted to human sweat because they can get their salts from human sweat. So you may see one of these little bees like following you if you're you know, hiking up a mountain or something like that. Um, for the most part, they don't have bad intentions. They just, they just want to lick you. They don't want to, to sting you. Um, and these are often medium or small. Um, and they definitely do have those pollen carrying hairs. Like we see in that picture on the top right, that bee is just covered in pollen. Um, and these bees are usually um, black or brownish um, with sometimes with these metallic tints. Um, these are bees that a lot of people often assume to be flies, um, especially when they're smaller. Um, but something like this bright green sweat bee on the bottom right, um, they are they're bees and they are super, super fast. Um, if you are trying to get a picture of one of these bright green bees or trying to catch it in a net, good luck because they move quicker than you do. Um, sometimes looking at these little green bees um, in a patch of flowers, it seems like they're teleporting to different flowers because you don't really see them flying and making the effort to, to move around, um, which is pretty cool. One note about these helictidae, because I did tell you that they don't have bad intentions when they're following you around. Um, these, these native bees that I'm talking about, they can sting. Um, female bees do have stingers and they can sting. But what's so interesting about um, these native bees and their stings is that in general, they hurt much less than a honeybee. Um, and we think that's because a honeybee has venom that is designed to fend off against 
mammals to protect their own honey and their hive from mammals that are trying to get to their resources versus the sweat bees. Um, they don't have that same history of trying to fight us off. Um, and so their venom that they, that they have is not you know, designed to be painful to mammals or anything like that. They also have in general, um, much smaller stingers. And so a lot of them don't really go into your skin very much. So I've been stung by all of the bees on this slide. Um, and they are not very painful. It's like a, it's like a light, you know, it's a light, light tap. Um, other fun fact about that is that these bees don't have barbed stingers. And so they can sting you more than once. So one of my friends is in this, um, in this Zoom webinar right now. And she was on a hike with me once when one of these little bees in the top right climbed into her sock um, and it stung her several times. So that was a fun story that she gets to um, cherish when she thinks about her love of bees. All right, our last family of bee that I'm gonna talk about is the Megachylidae family. And these ones are a little more speciose than some of these others, um, 4,100 species total. And these include things like leaf cutter bees and minor bees and resin bees. These are often a little bit bigger um, than the Helictidae. And they have this sort of like, some people call it a cigar shaped body. They're sort of uniformly thick. Um, there's no, you know, like cinching around the waist or anything like that that we'd think about like with a wasp. Um, and they like to carry their pollen on the underside of their abdomen, which is um, very interesting and very interesting to watch because sometimes you'll see one of these bees land on a flower and rather than, you know, like a honeybee or a bumblebee, you know, trying to get that pollen on a specific part of their body, you know, specifically on their leg or something. These guys just sort of wiggle around and just flop all over trying to, to pick up as much pollen as they can. And then they fly off, make their, make their way. So if you're ever in your garden and you see a leaf that looks like this, or you think someone has taken a big hole puncher to it or a pair of scissors, and for some reason it's cutting out circles, um, it was probably her. This is a female megachyle bee, um, and she will, with her nice sharp little um, mandibles, cut nice even circles in leaves, and then take those circles home to her nest, and she'll line the walls of her nest with it to keep it nice and dry. It's a nice little, nice little insulator. So if you like working outside, um, a great place to do that would be if you are researching bees. Um, so I've done um, a lot of really cool field work and field work for bees has been some of my favorite um, experiences in science with bees. So this is my friend, Taylor. Um, she and I collected bees out at North Campus Open Space, um, um, out past UCSB um, for a few years before she graduated. So this is uh, more shots of North Campus Open Space. Um, this was a part of the UCSB's project run by CBER, um, where we visit um, various sites throughout Santa Barbara and once a month set um, these pan traps, these plastic um, bright yellow bowls. Um, you see one in the top left picture here. Um, and we add soapy water to them and we leave them out all day. And what happens is over the course of the day, bees and other insects will fly by and they'll see this bright object and they'll fly down towards it. Um, and then of course, because the water has soap in it, um, the bees will break the surface tension, go to the bottom of the bowl. And then at the end of the day, we're able to collect all of the specimens. And so we would walk through um, North Campus Open Space and stop at these eight specific sites every month. Um, ended up getting some really great data. Other people um, on this project would set um, pan traps at coal, coal oil point reserve out past UCSB, um, the UCSB lagoon, UCSB north parcel, the greenhouse by Sieber, um, as well as some other places like the Carpinteria salt marsh and the, um, and the Santa Clara river in Ventura, as well as Santa Cruz Island. Santa Cruz Island is another spot that I've been fortunate enough to do field work at and is amazing. Um, these are all pictures from a bee collecting trip I took um, in April of this year. Um, and so we were um, setting pan traps, um, but also supplementing that with hand collecting with a net because um, different bee species um, will be attracted to pan traps and some of them won't. And so a lot of, a lot of times um, smaller bodied bees will go in the pan traps, but larger bees won't. Um, and so by supplementing our collections with a net, we're able to get a more even 
um, understanding of which bees are living on Santa Cruz Island. All right, another place I've done some really awesome field work has been in the Eastern Sierras. Um, so this summer I was on a team of community ecologists from UCSB um, and we were backpacking around um, the Eastern Sierras, um, collecting data on um, basically on these sites that have lakes with trout that have been introduced and sites that have lakes that um, have been undisturbed. They don't have the trout species introduced to them. And we're collecting all kinds of different data, but um, some of that data was the pollinator studies that we did. And so we would hand collect pollinators as well as set pan traps. Um, and so in the top row of pictures here are three different bombus, three different bumblebees um, that I saw up in the Sierras. The one in the middle landed on my leg during a hike. Um, the other two are behaving a little bit more typically on flowers. Um, and then in this bottom left picture, I am paddling around this little boat on a lake. Um, unfortunately, I'm not looking for um, aquatic bees, um, but that boat that I was in had all these different little um, sensors to map the bottom of the lake. So being interested in bees, um, let me you know, do some other really cool field work like paddling around this little boat in the Eastern Sierras. Okay, so how do we go from something on the left where it's these you know, bugs in soapy water to something that we see on the right, which is um, specimens that have been properly curated and cared for and have all of their um, information attached to them and ready to be used by researchers, ready to be kept um, in perpetuity for other researchers in the future. But we usually have this um, intermediate process where it looks a little bit more messy. But in general, um, all of these pan trap specimens, pan trap bees, will get washed first in hot water and then in ethanol. Um, and then they get to go in these nice little tea strainers and get dried with this fun little pink hair dryer. Um, and once that is done, they're ready to be pinned. And then once the bees are pinned, we can look at them under the microscope and try to identify them um, as, as well as we can. So sometimes that's to genus, sometimes that's to species. Um, but in general, these bees at this point will all get their um, location information and then they'll get their determination labels that will say you know, what type of bee they are. And they will also get uploaded to our online databases um, where researchers all throughout the world um, can freely use and access this data um, to answer their own research questions. So this graph right here is one example of using um, that bee data. And so for this, this is looking at the UCSB's project um, bees that we had collected. Um, and so in the graph we see on the x-axis, the different bee families. And then on the y-axis is the count of bees, so the number of bees that we've found in that family. And then those bars um, in the bar graph are divided up by genus. And so, for example, in the APD family, um, second from left, this large orange, um, orange portion of this bar is apis. So that is the apis mellifera honeybee. And then we see helictidae, the sweat bees, um, is super abundant. And in this blue color right here is all of the um, lazioglossum bees. So lazioglossum are the most um, abundant that we find in Santa Barbara. And lazioglossum is also um, the most specious um, bee genus that we know of, which is pretty cool. Um, the rectangle above lazioglossum, this green teal color is helictus. And that is also another sweat bee that we have. Um, and this is the bee that I ended up choosing to do um, my own personal research project on um, because I looked at Lazio Glossom and said there's a lot of data there, but um, that looks like a lot more work than something where we have a few um, less specimens. So that graph can look um, a, a lot of different ways depending on how we are analyzing it, um, but we can do things like split up um, bees that were collected at different areas. So in the center of North Campus open space on the right is Santa Cruz Island. Um, and we see that there's a different composition of bees um, depending on where we are in these two locations, which is really interesting. So for example, we see on um, Santa Cruz Island, a lot of these Andrinidae family bees, but we don't see them um, at North Campus open space. And we also see a lot more bees in general on Santa Cruz Island, but um, 
It's good to keep in mind that this graph is not telling us that there are more bees at Santa Cruz Island. It's just telling us that for the UCS Bees Project, we have collected more bees on Santa Cruz Island than we have at North Campus Open Space. And that can be due to lots of different factors. Um, also, this graph is a little bit out of date. Um, from that collecting trip that we took in April, we have just about finished um, going through all of our bees and they are now um, in transit to, um, they're well on their way to being, being uploaded and being incorporated into all of our data, but that'll add a few thousand um, bees that can make this Santa Cruz Island to North Campus open space gap much larger. So during the pandemic um, is when I started my independent research project because I had done all of this um, work towards curating all these other bees and collecting bees and it was all super cool. Um, and I decided I wanted to get um, involved with my own personal research. Um, and it obviously had to be something that I could do remotely. And so I decided to look at um, just the Helictus sweat bees. And so in Santa Barbara, we have three different species. There's Helictus tripartitis on the left, Helictus ligatus in the middle with those big um, cheek structures, and then Helictus farinosus on the right, which is a larger bodied bee than the other two. And I wanted to ask, um, can a computer looking just at their wings um, be able to, would it be able to identify which species of bee um, from this one genus the computer is looking at? And so to do this, I used um, this method called geometric morphometrics, which basically um, is a method of um, quantifying and comparing shape variation um, in different things. And so we can use this in lots of different ways, but one way with bee wings is to plot these landmarks on um, bee wing vein intersections. So these specific spots where the, the veins on the wing intersect, we plot these dots. Um, and we do that for lots of different wings. And then we can extract just those landmarks and use the X and Y coordinates of those landmarks in our statistical analyses. So then my second question um, was, and this was a little bit of a far-fetched question at first, and then this later became um, my emphasis, um, but it was, can this same method of using, looking at the wings be used to somehow quantify or identify variation in just one species of, so just Helictus tripartitis um, from Santa Cruz Island versus from the Santa Barbara mainland. And so these bees are not flying back and forth. So they are genetically isolated from each other. So I wanted to see, are they different? And if so, um, you know, they look, they look pretty much the same to the human eye. So is there some sort of variation that we're not seeing? And I wanted to use the wings to look at that. Um, and so to do this, I had to get a lot of bees. So I picked up a lot of bees outside Zebra um, and then took them home and took a lot of pictures of wings. So I took about 360 different photographs of wings, um, about 50 each of Helictus ligatus and Helictus farinosus. And then the rest were split pretty evenly between Helictus tripartitis from Santa Cruz Island and Helictus tripartitis from the Santa Barbara mainland. And then all of those bees had to get landmarked. So these same nine homologous landmarks. And then we were able to extract that data and use it in our statistical analyses. Okay, I'm gonna have some tea. Just a reminder, if you would like to send in your questions in the Q&A um, as they come up, you are more than welcome to do so. All right, so let's look at some data. So from my first question, can geometric morphometrics be used on those three different species of helictus? Um, we see that yes, it can. And this graph that we're looking at here um, is super cool. Each dot on this graph um, represents a single bee wing um, and they are color coded by which species they are. And on this graph, um, the closer together two dots are, the more similar they are. And the further two things are apart from each other, the more different they are. Um, and we see here that we get these nice little clusters depending on which species of helictus we're looking at. And remember, this is just by looking at the wings. And so um, the computer doesn't know which um, species is which and to put them next to each other until um, we plot all the dots. And then we say, okay, this, um, you know, color code it accurately, please. So this is the species that was this. And we see that these separate really nicely. Now, if you are a scientist 
or a statistician, even worse, you will know that this is not a statistical tool, but trust me, I did some other statistical tests too. Um, and these also show us that yes, these species are different. And the computer was 100% accurate in identifying you know, unknown samples. So things that we knew what species they were, but the computer didn't, just by looking at the wing was 100% accurate at picking which species it was. So that's super interesting because it can be used in other projects. So if you're doing a you know, restoration project or a monitoring project, and you're not a bee taxonomist for whatever reason, you don't want to um, you know, learn about how amazing bees are and look at a microscope for you know, several years to learn which species you're looking at. I don't know why you wouldn't want to do that, but let's say you do. Um, you can use something like this um, and you can get accurate results um, pretty easily if you're able to take a picture of a wing and plot some landmarks. Um, so this is a pretty cool, cool use of this, cool potential use of this. Now for my other question, um, we see a little bit of a different picture, right? So this is the island versus mainland Helictus tripartitis. And here um, a brown or orange dot is an island bee and a blue dot is a mainland bee. And they um, have a lot of overlap in the middle. Um, but we do see that these circles separate out um, a little bit on the ends, um, but they do overlap a, lot, overlap a lot in the middle. Um, and so we run some other statistical tests and we can argue that yes, they are different, um, statistically significantly different, but they have such a weak difference between the two of them. And so using a cross-validation test, so that's where the computer um, identifies, tries to identify random, random samples, um, they were 70, it was 72.8% accurate at doing so. So um, better than random, but um, definitely not 100% like the others. And so what we think this is an example of is, you know, this, this weak difference we're seeing is not necessarily, you know, evidence that, that these are on the road to becoming different species or anything like that, but it's likely due to the foundry effect, which is a concept in island biogeography that states that depending on who it was from a mainland source that colonized an island, um, the island population will look different. And so for example, like an extreme example would be if only, you know, large bees um, were the ones that colonized the island, um, then all the bees on the island would be larger than the ones on the mainland. And so here, maybe there's some, some small difference in something to do with the bee um, where we end up seeing a little bit of difference in the wings between the island and the mainland specimens. So with that conclusion of my research, I want to thank a lot of people that have made everything possible for me to do this type of work, but then I want to come back to the bees for a, for a better conclusion. So first, everyone on the UCS Bees Project, um, my mentors at UCSB, so Katya, Michelle, Claudia, and Caroline, um, Jamie for confirming our bee IDs, Yolanda for helping with landmarking, all the Seaver Lab Group, and then of course, everyone at the museum who's been a mentor for me over the years, so Jenna, Terry, Matt, Christine. Um, the photographs, um, that were not of bees, but were of me interacting with bees were courtesy of Kristen Palmstrom, the College of Creative Studies, and Jerry Thrift. Um, and then my funding sources for this um, research, which would not have been possible without, were the Coastal Fund, UCSB IRCA Grant, CCS Travel Fund, and the CCS SURF Grant. So there are over 20,000 different species of bees in the world. Um, California has about 1,600 of those species. Um, and in the Santa Barbara area, we find um, over 150 different species of bees. And I know I didn't cover all of those today in my talk, um, and I didn't try to. Um, my take home message that I hope, I hope everyone is able to get from this is that there are more, um, there's more to bees than just the honeybee. And there's more to bees than just the honeybee and the bumblebee and maybe the carpenter bee too. Um, and there's a lot that we still don't understand actually. And so knowing what is out there and being able to research it and then being able to preserve those specimens in a museum in a collection um, in perpetuity that researchers can use well into the future um, is so important because we live in a changing climate, changing world where um, species do go extinct every day. And if we don't know what we already have, um, it's impossible for us to make policies and make decisions and decide how to protect things and how to manage um, and how to plan for our future. Some of the bees that I used in my um, wing venation study um, were collected in the 1950s. Um, 
And my hope is that some of the views that I've collected over the last few years will be used by researchers well into the future. So that is why um, museums are so important and collection centers are so important and I'm so grateful for them. Um, and with that, I would be more than happy to take any questions that you have. Um, and I also want to um, add my contact info here in case anyone wants to um, distract me from my you know, teen programs manager job to talk about bees. There's my info there. So thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Charlie. That was fantastic. <laughs> thank you. Um, we've got lots of questions coming in. And one of them kind of goes back to the very beginning um, and asks, how many times have you been stung? That's a great question. Um, I haven't kept track is the is the honest answer, but I've been stung by honeybees and bumblebees and agapostamin. So that's the screen sweat bee here and halictus sweat bees, lazy blossom. So I, I'm, I'm working my way up. I haven't been stung by by all the bees that I've um, gotten to collect yet, but probably probably several is the answer. Yeah, you're in good company. It seems like the majority of people here have been stung by bees. Um, nice. I have not. I've never been stung by a bee. So. Well, there's always a first. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have a question from Paul. Are honeybees out competing native bees causing disruptions in their populations? Well, Paul, thank you. At first, you were one of my mentors that helped me back when I was a quasar in the museum. So thank you for that. And you are a beekeeper. Um, Obviously, um, there are lots of questions about whether honeybees are um, out competing native bees. The answer is definitely that it's complicated. Um, we think that there are some interactions between them. Um, we know that honeybees can do things in their environments like um, help invasive plants um, spread and which, which are harmful effects. Um, but overall, we don't see like honeybees, you know, fighting, like brawling it out with, with native bees on an individual flower. Um, there are lots of different studies about um, honeybees taking nectar in different ways than native bees, um, but we just, we need more research there. Thank you for the question. Awesome. Um, Jan wants to know, would a vacuum insect collecting net like a DVAC make a difference for your work? That would be, um, that's a great, that's a great question. We use, um, you know, lots of different ways to collect um, insects in general. And like a lot of people will use um, something similar to that to collect wasps. Um, we call it an aspirator. Um, and so I've used some of these for um, collecting insects that have been already put into one like smaller trap and then I'm moving them into a different vial. Um, but that is, a, that is a good question. I think if you were trying to do something like catch an entire swarm of bees, um, maybe that would be an option. I don't, I've never, I've never done that. I, I wouldn't want to be, um, you know, in the 60 foot radius of the person who was doing that, but it would be probably pretty fun to watch. So great, great suggestion. <laughs> um, Emily has a big question um, and a really great one. What is the biggest threat to native bees and how can we best support their population? That is a great question. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, I would, I would, um, you know, guess that the biggest threat to native bees is pretty similar to um, the biggest threat to, you know, all other, all other um, species, which is, um, you know, largely habitat loss and degradation, um, as well as, you know, some, some climate change being on the rise there, trying to, trying to compete with that cause. Um, but one of the best things that we can do is give them habitat. And so for, you know, we know that the majority of bees nest in the ground. Um, and so if we can set aside, you know, a portion of our yard or a portion of our garden that we're not going to mow or we're not going to, you know, dig up and plant things and just give them that space to, um, you know, set up, set up their, their time. If you want to support different bees, like if you want to support the megachylidae bees in particular, those, you know, cigar shaped ones with the hairy abdomens, you can do things like set up um, little bee hotels, I think they call them, because some of them like to like to nest in these specific, you know, widths of, um, you know, um, wood piping and stuff like that. Um, carpenter bees obviously love wood. And so having some sort of like unfinished, you know, chunk of wood in your yard, if that's something that you want to do. Um, these are all small effects, obviously, um, but we can support things like sustainable agriculture and, you know, trying to reduce pesticide use. Um, and trying to support native bees on um, larger agricultural farms. So the way that honeybees are often used is shipping them in 
um, letting them pollinate, you know, the almond crop or whatever for the, you know, two weeks that that is in bloom and then shipping them out. Um, and then, you know, all other 50 weeks of the year, that's just a dead zone where there are no flowers in bloom. And so by doing things like, you know, supporting farms that put up little hedgerows where they have wildflowers growing so that bees can live on the farm and then the bees can pollinate their crops for free. Um, those are all, all good ways that we can do that. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Tara. Um, what other applications or projects might benefit from the computer technology you've described in your talk? That is a great question. Um, the sky is the limit. So if you want to use that for something, um, I think you should. But um, I think there are lots of benefits for making um, identification of insects easier, as well as um, seeing things that we're not able to see ourselves very easily. So geometric morphometrics um, is often used to um, quantify you know, very small changes in things. Um, and so this has been used in things like um, analyzing fossils and um, analyzing differences in um, bone structure and stuff like that. So all of those, all of those things are great, um, great uses of this type of technology. Awesome. Um, let's see here. Of the 1600 species of bees in California, how many are native? Great question. Um, I guess there's a, there's a difference between um, native and um, like endemic. So a lot of these bees are not necessarily, you know, um, they didn't start in this area, like the Santa Barbara bees that we have, um, you know, they didn't start in Santa Barbara, they're not endemic to Santa Barbara, but they are native to this region. Um, and so I would say to answer your question, the majority of them are, um, you know, they weren't, weren't introduced. There are a few different species. Um, in Santa Barbara, we have a um, Megachyle bee, Megachylidae bee that was introduced, um, the Protosmia ruby floris. Um, and it's this cute little small bee with these um, little white striped abdomen. And so it's an introduced bee. Um, but in Santa Barbara, at least, all of our other bees are native. Awesome. We've got a really great question from Terry here. Um, do native bees have mites as parasites? And how do they take care of it by themselves? Oh, that is a great question. Um, yes, mites definitely parasitize um, native bees as well as honeybees. Um, and they don't have a great method of taking care of them. Um, a lot of the time we'll collect bees um, and then we will wash them and water and ethanol and dry them and um, brush them with a little hairbrush and pin them. And then under the microscope, we'll still find mites attached to them. Um, so yeah, they definitely do get parasitized by mites. Mites are, um, they, they take what they can get and native bees feel the brunt of that sometimes. Um. Do honeycomb come from all bees? Oh, great question. No. Um, so honeybees are the only bees that make honey. Um, and so the other bees that do not make honey. So honey is interesting. It's this great food that lasts for a long time um, that they can use to provision their hive throughout a winter. Um, but all these other bees that are solitary and don't have to support a hive, um, they don't need something like that on hand. They don't need to keep a big pantry stocked. Um, and so they won't make honey um, and they won't have honeycomb. And so if that is um, you know, just disappointing to you and uh, you know, your efforts to support native bees, I will say that native bees are so pretty and you should support them even though we can't eat their honey because they don't have it. Awesome. We have a lot of fantastic questions, but to keep us on time, um, I'll ask one more that I think right. is a really important question. Um, if we plant more native plants, will we get more native bees? That is a great question. And the answer is um, yes. If we plant more native plants, we should get more native bees um, and we will be supporting them. A lot of native bees, um, you know, a lot of them are generalists and they'll, they'll pollinate and get their resources from what they can. So we'll see bumblebees often on rosemary and rosemary is of course an introduced plant species here. Um, but we won't see a lot of these other native bees on those flowers because they like you know, native plants. And so if we do plant more native plants and support them, um, we'll be essentially giving more food and more habitat and more space for native bees to enjoy and use. And we'll benefit from it too, because um, that'll be a great observation point for you to, to see um, some native bees in action. So thank you for that question. Awesome. 
I know we've had a lot of questions and I may not have gotten to all of them tonight, um, but please feel free to reach out to Charlie, reach out to myself and we will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Charlie, for your fantastic talk tonight um, and all of you for joining us. Um, we hope we will see you on January 10th for our next Science Pub from Home, Fishes of Southern California and Oil Platforms. Thank you all and take care. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Bye.